Hi everyone, welcome. Thank you for bearing with us for a couple of minutes. We were just dealing with some technical things on the back end. Thanks for joining us this evening. Just gonna give it a couple of minutes in case there are some other folks who are arriving a little later as well. Um, while we're doing that, I just wanted to mention that um, feel free to use the chat this evening um, and also the Q&A function in Zoom. Um, if you have questions, if you could put them in the Q&A specifically so that we can keep track of that, that would be really helpful. And then use the chat for any other kind of comments. Um, within the Q&A um, feature, there is... Um, we've enabled a little thing called upvoting. So if somebody asks a question and you like that question, or it's a question that you would also want to ask, you can click a like button and that'll move it to the top so that we can see what kind of questions people would like us to ask the most. Um, so please feel free to participate in that way. Um, we also have um, somebody with us this evening who is doing live captioning. So if you require the, those services, you can either view the live transcript um, in Zoom or you can view it in stream text. And I'm gonna drop that link into the chat now for everybody um, in case you would prefer to um, view it that way. There you go. And Sophie, just quickly, I see here that the chat is currently disabled. Is that well, that? That should not be the case. Thank you for letting me know that. How do I change that? That's a great question. They said an anonymous attendee uh, wrote that in the Q&A. Yeah, I see my chat is up, but it only says hosts and panelists. So hmm. I think I think the attendees are not seeing it. Hmm. Um, it says click oh. on the three dots at the end of the chat and mm -hmm. send everyone. So I see. I've got it. Okay. Thank you. It takes a village. <laughs> it takes a village. Thank you, everybody. I think that should be working now. And I'll change it for the panelists as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That was great. Yay. It's working. Thank you. Thank you. All right, let's see, other housekeeping things. Um, we are recording this evening, so um, you can always come back to, to watch this again. And for those who aren't able to be with us, um, we will link to this later. Um, so folks can view it at another time. Um, and also, you know, we're here um, because we want to share information with you all. So please feel free to participate, like I said, in the chat, in the Q&A. Um, you know, we're here um, because we want to- that this um, is um, an accessible opportunity and that it's clear. So if there's things that we need to clarify, please feel free to let us know. Or if there's something that we're missing, you can also tell us that as well. Um, and I think with that, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, I'm gonna share my screen with you all um, so you can see what we're gonna be chatting about this evening. Can you see that? Not yet. There we go. Yeah? Yeah. All right. Well, welcome, everybody. We're here to talk about um, a new public art opportunity that we have over at the Holgate Library. Um, it's called the Exterior Site Enclosure. Um, we're referring to it as that anyway. It might eventually be called something else. Um, and we're here to talk about the opportunity. So here's the agenda for tonight. We're gonna to do introductions in just a moment, uh, talk a little bit about accessibility, 
Um, my colleague Salvador, who's here with us tonight, is going to speak a little bit about RAC. Um, I'll then talk a little bit more about the library bond capital project in general. And then um, Jeannie and I will talk together about the Holgate Library and the project there, um, the specific art opportunity and the goals of that artwork. And then we'll talk about eligibility, the selection process and timeline, the RAC Opportunity Portal, and we'll leave some time for Q&A. So to begin with, let's do introductions. I can start. My name is Sophie, and I am one of the public art project managers at RAC, and I am overseeing the public art elements at Holgate Library. And I will pass it to Jeannie. Yes, hi everybody. Uh, my name is Jeannie Lai. Um, I have she, her pronouns. Uh, I am part of the architecture team uh, from Bohr Architecture and Interiors. We have many collaborators, but I'm here to represent and share the design um, to clarify um, the scope. So Salvador, I'll pa pass it to you. Thanks, Jeannie. Hello, everyone. My name is Salvador. I am a project manager on the public art team here at Rack, and I am happy to be here to help uh, facilitate and answer additional questions um, with my colleague, Sophie. Thanks, Sal. Um, and then LaDonna is here as our interpreter um, and um, cart provider this evening. Okay, so accessibility and assistance. Um, we at Rack offer um, different services to make our opportunities accessible. There's some listed here on the screen. Um, so for example, if you wanted to apply for this or another opportunity and we're having difficulty with the um, RAC opportunity portal, you could reach out to one of us and we would see how we could assist you with that. Um, we offer language translation for our, our materials and our applications. Um, there's some information at the bottom of the screen here. If you require those kinds of services, you can email us at info at rack.org and request excuse me, request those materials in a different language and we will take care of um, uh, doing that for you and then passing those translated materials back, back on. Um, we also offer large print materials and materials in alternate uh, formats for those um, who require uh, materials uh, in different formats to do with visual needs. Um, interpretation services such as ASL and also language um, depending on the if we're in a meeting or um, something like that, and additional um, language interpretation services are needed. We have other process accommodations for folks who live with disability. Again, that varies depending on um, the folks we're talking about. So um, if you require those kinds of services, please reach out and we can talk about your specific needs. Um, and then captioning, as we talked about for this evening, we have available. Um, Sal, I'm going to pass it over to you to talk a little bit more generally about what we do at RAC um, and what we offer as an organization. Yeah, thanks so much. Um, so for those that are just not uh, familiar uh, with RAC, uh, which is short for <clears throat> Regional Arts and Cultural Council, we are a nonprofit um, that has been around now for 27 years. Um, and we used to be part of the city and the county at one point as um, Metropolitan Arts Commission. Um, in 27 years ago, though, when we became a nonprofit, um, we contracted right back with the city and the county to handle the arts investments. So we are stewards of um, those arts resources, um, which have in pretty much our um, uh, so distributed and ultimately facilitated through these programs that you see here. Um, so we offer grants to individual artists and arts organizations. Um, we do advocacy work, working with both city and county um, elected officials. Uh, and uh, we also have been helping to facilitate the arts tax, AEAF, um, and we are a convener. Um, we do sort of hold regional um, uh, initiatives. And then myself and uh, Sophie, we were particularly in the public art program, managing uh, the 2% for our ordinance, 
which uh, stipulates that 2% of county and city capital construction projects uh, goes to art making, which is actually how this project is being funded, so. Yeah, that's great, thank you, Sal. And this just gives um, folks a little more detail about our specific mission. Um, you can find more information about us at rack.org and you can also follow us um, online through our social media. Um, Instagram is at regional arts. Um, I thought maybe we could talk a little bit, Sal, about the public art department specifically and what we do um, for folks who maybe um, don't know too much about public art and all the things we do within the department. Yeah, so the 2% for our ordinance that I mentioned earlier, um, that really does allow us to do all of this kind of programming that you see here on the slide. Um, so we do everything from uh, permanent uh, work um, that would be both exterior and then interior or architecturally integrated work. It allows us to do um, the purchase of 2D 2D portable works um, that move within the sound, city and county buildings. Um, we also do a variety of temporary art initiatives. Um, we, I particularly oversee the murals program um, and we do a lot of conservation maintenance. And then we've done another other initiatives over the last few years like Support Beam, um, Black Portland Matters Art and Placemaking Initiative, um, and then variety of other kinds of art projects with specific um, community organizations. So it, it's our program is broad. We're doing a lot. Um, but yeah, um, the resources we're able to do helps to uh, make that all possible. Thank you. Okay, so to talk a little more specifically about this project, um, just wanted to give a little overview um, about the library capital bond projects um, specifically. So this was um, a bond that was passed in 2020. Um, it includes expansions and renovations to seven branch libraries, which include Albina, Belmont, Holgate, Midland, North Portland, Northwest and St. John's. Um, there is also a destination library being built in East County and um, all uh, library facilities are getting new internet. Um, every, everyone's gonna be upgraded. Um, and then a new materials and handling and distribution center is being built in Southeast, which is actually very close to the, the Midland Library and not that far from Holgate also. Um, so to talk about Holgate Library a little more uh, in depth, um, it's like, for those who don't know, Holgate is located at the Northeast corner of Southeast 79th and Holgate. It's uh, in, in the Foster Powell neighborhood technically, but it's also very close to Lentz. And it's also not far from Mount Tabor and some other uh, Southeast neighborhoods uh, close by. Holgate is considered part of the chapter one project phase um, as part of the capital bond. Um, so within that chapter one um, phase, there are four libraries that are getting their renovations um, and expansions first. So those include Albina, North Portland, Holgate and Midland. Um, Holgate is one of the first scheduled to reopen, which should be around late spring, early summer of 2024. Um, Essentially, the existing library as we know it, um, it's currently a 6,000 square foot space, uh, will be demolished and then a new 21,000 square foot library will be constructed um, on the same site. Um, so as part of that um, new construction, there will be a new uh, entry plaza on the south side and a new outdoor patio on the north side. Um, so this new construction creates um, opportunities for public art. Um, Jeannie, I don't know if there's anything as that you want to add there as uh, someone who's leading the project. <laughs> no, I think you cover the, the, the facts re really well. I, okay. um, I think there'll be more to share in a minute about the new design, so. Okay. So to talk about the specific art opportunity, um, the exterior site enclosure, um, this is one of two public art elements at Holgate Library. Um, the second um, public art opportunity is going through a different process. Um, so 
there will be um, other things coming about that in the future. Um, but this is a open call process. So we're re uh, seeking requests for qualifications. So that's why you all are here, hopefully, to submit some applications for this, um, this piece of public art. Um, the exterior site enclosure is a purpose-built space, like I said, on the north side of the new building. It will be between um, the new parking lot and 79th Ave. This will become clearer in a moment when I show you a visual, so just bear with me. Um, and it is a out, it's an exterior space that will be used for um, library staff, bike parking, and then building trash receptacles. And um, so what we're looking for is um, an artist or an artist team who can create a 2D wall-mounted exterior artwork, which may also encompass texture and 3D elements. The artwork will wrap the enclosure on the south and west side walls. Um, as it's outside, the artwork must be durable, um, must be able to withstand the elements, be graffiti resistant and easily cleanable for all of those reasons. Um, the wall behind the artwork will be um, cinder block essentially, also known as CMU. Um, the south wall is approximately eight by 35 um, feet and the west wall is approximately eight by 13. So the combined total area for art is approximately 384 square feet. Um, it will be highly visible, the artwork will be highly visible as this will be one of two main entryways into the building. Um, and on the ground floor inside the, the, the new library, um, there are some uh, flex spaces that which will be used for different activities and programming, um, classes, things like that for library staff and patrons of the library. And so this artwork will actually be a backdrop to those flex spaces as well. The project budget is $30,000. Um, excuse me, and it we there is also a separate allowance for materials fabrication and installation. So that thirty thousand um, dollars includes your artist fee, um, fee or time for your design development, community engagement, communication with the project team, and coordination with the project team. Um, but anything that you would need for materials fabrication and installation comes from a separate um, bucket, basically. Jeannie, is there anything you want to add to that that part? Okay, I see a hand raised. Um, I'm just gonna go over the, the map and then I'll come to you, okay? Um, so this is um, a map of the space that we were just um, describing. So hopefully this makes a little more sense um, seeing it visually. And I'm hoping you can also see my um, arrow. Um, so here is 79th Ave that, that's running here. And then Southeast Holgate Boulevard is running here east to west. So this is going to be the new site for the library. Um, the south entry is down here. And then the north entry is over on this side. The new parking lot will be up here on the north side that I was just describing. And so the um, exterior site enclosure is here. Um, so as I was saying, it's gonna be between the new parking lot and 79th Ave. As you can see here, these are the flex spaces on the ground floor. And there's um, a wall, this wall at the back here has a lot of windows. So folks will be able to see this artwork from those inside spaces. And then this outdoor patio also has areas for seating. So we're hoping that this will be a space for folks to gather and spend time as well as um, a walk through an entryway. So it'll be highly visible, like I was saying, um, to folks um, walking in through um, to the library from 79th Ave, as well as the parking lot, and then folks who want to gather in this space as well. Um, this longer wall here, this pink line, is the south side wall, and then this shorter side is the west. So as I was saying, the artwork will wrap the west and south sides. There is a flower bed, um, in front of it, and Jeannie will know the specifics about um, the depth of that, but there is a flower bed on the, the ground in front of it, creating a little bit of a buffer um, for the artwork, which also lends itself um, to essentially help to protect the artwork <laughs> a little bit. Um, and 
This is also why we can um, enable that there to be some 3D elements and texture um, because we can allow for some depth there as well without you know, there being an impact on um, access or walkways and things like that. Um, somebody previously had their hand raised, but it seems like it may have gone now. Sal, do you see somebody? Is somebody? I see, I see Karen's um, hand up. Yeah. Okay. Let me see. And Sophie, does it make sense for Karen to maybe, uh, to if she has a question, ask the question in the Q&A or the chat? Yeah, Karen, if you're able to um, ask the question in the Q&A, that would be helpful. Because um, I'm not sure if I can, I don't think I have control to unmute. Yeah. Um, so if you would, if you would be able to ask your question in the Q&A box, that would be really helpful. But I don't mind stopping. You don't need to wait to the end is what I'm saying. I don't mind stopping to answer your question now. Um, and then these images over here on the left are just some um, example images that the design team have pulled together of things that could potentially be um, on, the, on the exterior site enclosure. Um, you know, so we have been thinking about and talking about murals, but as I said, um, you know, there, there is the potential for uh, texture and 3D elements. So we've also talked about tile, mosaics, um, you know, other, other um, durable materials that could, could withstand outside. It could be a mix also, there could be a combination of materials used. Um, okay, I'm seeing um, a question. Yes, what is the budget? for the production the materials part. Um, you know, Karen, I would need to double check that. And because I'm sharing my screen right now, I, I will need to come back to you if that's okay. Um, I don't have my that in my written notes. I think that's, yeah, we can type it in, Sophie, when you know. Yeah. yeah. Um, okay, I'm gonna move on to the next slide. Oh, unless Jeannie, unless there's anything else you want to point out while I've got the map up. Uh, I think we cover everything. There's a couple more slides, so I, I can add to, to the few couple that All are right. coming up. We'll jump in whenever you like. Okay. Um, okay. So this is a rendering of the site um, that we were talking about. So this is the west wall here. And this is the south side. And you can see a little bit better in this rendering um, the relationship between the exterior site enclosure and the, the library building itself here. And what I was talking about in terms of seating and gathering and um, landscaping and things like that. Yeah, just to add to Sophie's, those program, those flexible rooms that are just inside the building that has a view of this artwork, um, that will host a variety of events. Um, including children's sort of story time, as well as community, you know, training activities or classes, uh, public meetings, all, all of those things can happen in those spaces. So this is a pretty visible uh, piece to, to all that's going on in those uh, rooms. Yeah. Okay, and this is kind of like a bird's eye view rendering. Um, so you can see here, um, this is the, um, the landscaping buffer around the south and west side. And then um, the, I think one of the things that we had talked about before, Jeannie, was that this wall is not, um, it's not straight. Right. Well, this, well it's, it's it's angled. Right. It's it's at an angle, um, mostly to give that um, a little bit more visibility and to open up that space between the building and and the site enclosure. So um, as you walk in, I think Sophie was saying this before. As you walk in, you you will not only see the the um, sort of end wall, the shorter wall, but you'll catch a glimpse of what's happening on the long wall as well. And the landscape buffer that we added is exactly what um, Sophie had said, is to provide a little bit more protection against the, um, the artwork, um, just to give it a little bit more space so people aren't literally walking up to it. And, and then in the previous image, I just wanna mention that the, the planting um, that are, uh, designed for that for that 
uh, planting strip is pretty low, so um, it will not grow to take over that wall or to take over the uh, in front be in front of the artwork. So they'll stay pretty low, yeah. uh, a foot or two kind of thing. Yeah. Thank you for mentioning that, Jeannie. I was about to say that. Yeah, that <laughs> it's going to be low, low plants. <laughs> yes. Okay. And then this is just a, another rendering of the elevation, so you can see a little more um, specifically the, the, spe uh, the square footage of each side. So 288 square feet on the south side and 88 square feet on the west. Um, these are some sort of precedent images that the design team have been thinking about um, in terms of texture. And Jeannie, I don't know, these, these images come from your team, so I don't know if you want to talk a little bit about some of the ideas you, you all have been having. Yeah, so we, um, we know it obviously can be a mural, um, but we, we wonder if there are opportunities for some, some sort of three-dimensionality to the piece that either could um, that some of these represent. So we like the idea that has a little bit of uh, depth to it. So some of these have kind of a, a form to the, it's still kind of a fairly flat uh, surface, but it has some form to it. Um, and then some of them are also materials. It is a CMU block. So um, we can smooth it out to provide the the artist with the smooth surface, but at the same time, maybe there's uh, another material applied. Um, so example of like um, tile work that applies over it in which we would not have to do anything to the CMU wall, we would just leave it as is. So it's, it's um, so depending on the idea, um, I think there are some other things that we can make sure to collaborate and, and make sure to, um, talk with the artist about to make sure it's delivered. The wall is is in, intended by the artist, depending on what, what happens there. So these are just some ideas about tile or three-dimensional pieces um, that isn't, um, that, you know, doesn't intrude too much into the space, uh, but gives, gives some depth and shadow, light and shadow. Yeah. Um, yeah, and we had we had talked about that in the call that um, you know the 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 three D elements and the texture could be either literal or it could be illusion potentially as well. Yeah. Sophie, we've got a couple questions here. Yeah, go uh, ahead. The first one is: since there's a budget for installation, is it discouraged to paint directly onto the wall, and is it preferred to use a vinyl wrap or panels? Um, okay, so two part question. I would say, and Jeannie, you feel free to jump in as well um, as you're leading the design team, but I would say, no, it's not discouraged to paint onto the wall um, at all. Um, I think that we're open to what the artwork could be for sure. Um, I think that it could be vinyl wrap or panels. I think it would depend on the proposal, on the artwork, and um, yeah, I think it would depend on the artist he selected. Um, I think that at this point, because we, where we're at is, you know, in terms of the application process is a request for qualifications. We're not at a proposal part yet. So I think there's still a lot of time for that, those ideas to develop. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't worry too much about those details and specifics just yet. Um, I think if you're coming with those kinds of ideas, that's really, great and exciting. Um, and I think that there are other things that would need to happen um, as part of the selection process to determine which direction we would be heading in. Great. And then the second question is, uh, are there limitations in height verticality beyond the wall? I would say yes to that. Um, the, the wall, the height of the wall is eight feet. So it is limited to that. Yes, thanks, Jean. Okay. Okay, so the goals of the artwork. Um, I, I would like, I think what I would want to start with here, because we've talked about it a lot, is um, we're, we're trying to ensure that a lot of the community that is served by Holgate is represented and reflected in the artwork um, or the new, the new artwork, the new library. 
And one of the things that we've talked a lot about lately is how it's it's a little bit of an impossible ask to expect that from one artist and one artwork. And so instead, what we're really um, looking for is for the, the myriad of artwork that will eventually be at the library to do that job together as a collection. So um, while we do want to center community and their stories and we do want the community to be represented and reflected in this artwork um you know it, we're not expecting one artist to do that in this one piece um, as i mentioned there is a second um, public piece of public artwork going into this project um, there are other um elements within the library that do not involve um, rack and, and public art um but but are art centered um so there are lots of ways for um, the community to be represented through art in this project. And so collectively they'll tell that story. Um, that being said, as this is um, a piece that is at one of the main entryways to the library, um, we are wanting it to create a sense of welcome and a sense of belonging, um, to be inviting, um, to really inspire folks and all the things that can happen. Um, at libraries, I think all of us who are working on this project and a lot of the artists who are applying for these um, the projects as part of the library bond feel very strongly about libraries and, and what they are to the community and the spaces that they are and what can happen in those spaces. So we really want to manifest all of all of that into um, an artwork. Um, there are a lot of design directives being given by the design team and so those things do need to be considered. Um, they shouldn't necessarily be taken literally though, they, so this artwork should complement those things, um, but we're not expecting um, literal representations or interpretations of those things. Um, so they should complement the architecture, the exterior and interior design palette and align with overall goals. Um, of, of the project and to and the and especially to represent and reflect community um, but as I said they don't necessarily need to be literal interpretations um, of those uh, design concepts. Um, Jeannie do you want to talk a little bit about participatory design and what's happened so far with community engagement? Yeah so um, one of the key goals of the project is as Sof Sophie has said uh, make sure that the uh, communities of the Holgate Library is included and uh, has a voice. And so we have had um, a lot of community engagement on this project throughout. Uh, we've done a couple of uh, different things and, you know, not just engage and talk to folks about what they're looking for throughout sort of early design process, but also to include some voting into our um, our process. So I'll share in a couple of slides upcoming about how that's been done. But um, so um, I think a goal for the project is to include that in the art as well. So we're asking for artists who um, also um, can have uh, some sort of community engagement as part of the development of this work. Um, that could be done in many different ways. It's not prescriptive to exactly how it should be done, but we're looking for uh, the piece to be have some participatory aspect to it with the community that could be a, a focus sort of event, um, asking uh, the input, or it could be if it was a mural, it could be, you know, that it's painted with with community members. Um, so you know, too too many to name, but just a few ideas and maybe um, Sophie you have more to add to that, but. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I know we, um, we've got a lot of questions about community engagement in the past when we brought this up. And so one of the things I, I do want to mention is that, you know, in, in my experience, I think a lot of artists do include community engagement in their work. They maybe just don't call it that. Um, and so I want to encourage you all to think about things that are maybe non-typical and non-traditional ways of connecting with community and connecting with folks in your work that maybe you, you yourselves don't even realize is considered community engagement. So some examples of that are mentoring, teaching, volunteering, community organizing, um, helping to organize events in your community, um, maybe helping to organize events at your kids' schools or um, volunteering with your, you know, local 
food pantry. I'm not sure. Um, but all of that to me is community engagement. And I think that the skills that you learn there are transferable. And so, um, I, yeah, I would just I would just encourage you to consider those things as also a way of engaging with community. Um, and yeah, I think that um, one other thing to mention is that the details of the community engagement um, work that's been done already um, will be made available to an artist or artist team that is selected. So you, you'll have access to that. Um, and I think let's move on to the next couple of slides so that people can see the, um, what you were talking about, Jeannie. Um, sure in terms of the design concepts. Yeah, so early feedback um, and, and feedback throughout the project has been really centered around uh, creating a welcoming space that's open, that has a lot of natural light. Um, we're incorporating wood in uh, the building. Uh, it's part of the structure of the building. Um, so it's a, it's a sort of feature that you'll see when you walk into the building. Um, we've really tried to um, include um, a lot of connections to to the outdoors that has been a theme that's uh, been sort of throughout the engagement feedback that we've heard so you'll see that the design really um, tries to be very natural very calming uh, focus on nature we have plants inside which is actually pretty unusual for a library um, because you know somebody has to take care of the plants and and that's usually uh, uh, um, not included in traditional libraries of the past um, so we really focusing on those things um, on this and as we were developing the butterfly became um, a symbol it's it's not like we are drawing butterflies on the wall or, or anything in very little ways but it's just become a symbol of, of the project for for you know good reasons since it's a symbol of resilience hope um, beauty grace uh, love and transformation so lots of things that really reflect the uh, immigrant population that um, is around the the, lib the whole gate library yeah um, a little bit more on that we the library is um, has very uh, high sustainability goals um, it is if you guys have heard of lead um, it is a program that um, that uh, is focused around sustainability for building design. So we are targeting a goal certification for that. And these are the different, um, I'm not gonna go into details on this, but um, these are some of the key goals around daylighting, uh, resilience, um, uh, carbon impact of the project. Uh, wood is actually very low, lowest for a structure. So that's been chosen because of the carbon impact. It also has solar panels on the uh, roof of the building and it's an all electric building. So those are all uh, reducing carbon impact on our, um, on, on our project. Um, and then we've also really looked for, in terms of site ecology, uh, we actually cannot, or we did not end up having a green roof on the project, but we are uh, working to make sure the planting is um, pollen, uh, pollinator friendly, um, really trying to, to kind of respect the butterfly uh, concept and, and symbol that's been been talked about for the project. Yeah, thank you, Jeannie. Yep. And then our next slide, this is um, describing um, the uh, public boating that you were mentioning. Yep, so we, we've had two different public votes. Um, the first one was more of an interior. So three, three color concepts were shared out. And the community came back with uh, with this one, which really is drawing out the natural materials, calming colors. Which is this um, one so, on the left. Yeah, on the left side, you can kind of see the, the palette that's been chosen. And then when we went back out to uh, the community once again for the exterior color of the building, this was just recent as actually just this voting closed like two weeks ago. Um, and so we had several colors. Um, the green one also prevailed. Um, I think uh, the community is really, really telling us they, they want the, the nature connection and um, the Pacific Northwest connection as well. 
So that that also came back uh, with with a green. So the buildings can be green. I'll talk a little bit about the exterior material as well. You can see that pattern that's shown um, with the number one there. That is a metal panel. It has a special custom um, profile to it just to add more um, uh, shadow, light and shadow to it. It gives it a little bit of life. As you walk by, it kind of changes. Um, so the, the metal panel also has a metallic finish. So it's it's not only green, but it has little metal flecks in it. So it kind of reflects light. Um, so that's, that's th those two. And I heard you had quite the turnout for the public vote for the exterior. Yeah, so we had over 2000 votes for the for the recent exterior voting. So and then I, I believe it was just under 1000 for the for the interior voting when we first started. So getting getting the word out more. And I think people are realizing that those are going on. So we're getting more and more participation, which is great. I love that. I love that. Obviously, the community are excited. Yeah. Speaking of, here we are, a little bit more about community engagement. Um, so here's a list on the left-hand side of the communities um, served by Holgate Li Library. Um, and as Jeannie mentioned, community engagement is a core, core value of the project. So we are seeking an artist or artist team who welcomes and reflects diverse communities and community engagement in their work um, and within their process. Um, it would we would prefer that um, that the selected artists have experience um, and interest in inviting community community members into their work and practice. Um, you know there is a difference between um, working with community and working with community, <laughs> if that makes sense. You know there's a difference between presenting an idea uh, and getting feedback versus seeking input. Um, before creating a design you know those those are two different ways of, of working um, um, prior to the finalizing of the design um, we would like the uh, selected artist um, or artist team to facilitate at least two community engagement sessions again as Jeannie um, explains, um, we don't really want to be too prescriptive about that at this point. I think it really depends on the artist and who's selected and what ideas they have. Um, but I think that the project team is open to what that could look like. Um, between RAC and the design team and also Multnomah County Library's um, community engagement department, um, there is a lot of support there um, for us to help with, with that outreach and that engagement. Um, and so um, we can we can help with ideas and things that that could be possible. Um, but um, yeah, I don't think um, being too prescriptive about it at this time is is helpful. I think it really depends on on who's selected and and what comes up as part of that process. Jean, do you want to say anything about this this community feedback? Um, I, th these are just uh, some summarizing of what um, big themes that came about as part of the community process. So you can kind of see we've already talked about a few of these, but, um, yeah. you know, healthy, making a joyful, diverse space. Um, the design really tries to make really flexible space. So anything, you know, all the different things are going to happen uh, in a library, um, really focusing on people space as opposed to mm -hmm. space for books, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of the, the older models of a library. This, this library really focuses on, on people spaces. Um, and then, um, yeah, inter interactive, I will just point out, I think, um, you know, open to the art having an interactive component, people want to engage. So that's been that's been a, a theme throughout. So yeah, I think that's a good point. And um, just to mention that as the artwork will be outside and it will be uh, even with the landscaping buffer, it will be touchable. And so I think that that's something to consider that, you know, there's um there's a, a point at which we can't be too precious about the artwork and at a certain point, you know, you have to re you have to release ownership of it and give it to the community, and um, and so I think you know just having that understanding in mind that the artwork will be touched, and so to just take that take that into account. 
Um, so thinking about who's eligible for this opportunity, um, RAC is committed to engaging new communities of artists and expanding the range of artistic and cultural expression represented in the city's public art collection. RAC is also committed to reflecting the cultural richness of our city by promoting opportunities for emerging and historically underrepresented artists. So with that said, we strongly encourage communities of colour to apply. Um, artists and artist teams based in Oregon and Washington are eligible for this opportunity. If you're applying as a team, at least one member of the team must meet the residency criteria. Um, so that means at least one member of the team must live in either Oregon or Washington. Um, again, applicants who have an interest in or experience with community engagement processes, including social practice, are highly desirable. Specifically, those who have experience working with youth, um, and residents from historically underrepresented and marginalized communities, uh, including immigrant and refugees, um, are highly, highly preferred. Those who have um, connection to Southeast um, Portland or potentially Holgate Library, uh, for the Foster Powell Lentz neighborhood, um, we would also like to hear from you. Um, that personal connection really makes a difference um, for sure in this project. Um, and also just thinking in terms of schedule, um, this uh, artist or artist team must be able to complete and install their artwork um, by March 2024. So a little bit so, about, oh, sorry, go on, Sal. Just really quickly, we did get an, a question. Um, will the artwork be lit and will that be in the artist budget or the building budget? That's a good question. Um, Jeannie? Yes. Um, so the art, uh, that wall is not, does not have any special lighting to it. So if there's a lighting desired, it would have to come out of the, the art budget, but we can certainly coordinate with, with the building, um, to make that happen. Thank you. Was there anything else Sal, right now? Yeah. And there's, uh, we just got an additional question. Mm -hmm. Can you describe the function use of this building that the artwork will enclose? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Jeannie, do you want to? You want me to? <laughs> okay. Um, so yeah, so this uh, this enclosure will be used for staff, library staff, bike parking, and also building trash receptacles. Yeah, the doors are on the uh, parking lot side. Um, so. Yeah, so access will be on the north side of this enclosure. Yeah. Thank you. So at the moment, the selection process is entirely virtual. So we do everything this way over Zoom at the moment. Um, the panel for this project includes representatives from Multnomah County Library. We have local artists, community members, and East County residents also um, on the panel, uh, folks from the library bond uh, team and um, the design team as well. Um, it is a very diverse panel and everybody comes with a different background and perspective and approach to art. Um, the job of the panel in this process is to review submissions and applications and choose three to five finalists to invite to interview. Our hope is that we will have an artist selected by December of this year. Um, the criteria that the panel will be using to select an artist is on the right hand side of this slide. So. Um, quality of past work, um, ability and interest in creating site-specific artwork, how past work fits the artwork goals, specifically community engagement, and interest in or ability to create connection to Holgate Library and the surrounding neighborhoods. So now we're going to go into how to apply. And Sal, I was hoping you could um, help me with this because you are a pro at this part. Yeah. Um, and Sophie, do do we have a slide of just the 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 what the perfect? Um, so this would be the actual um, homepage for our uh, Rec Opportunity Portal. Um, if you have an account, wonderful, just sign on in, um, and you can be able to find the opportunity where all of our opportunities are at which not only includes public art calls, but also if there's a grant uh, call happening, um, that's also usually there. Um, 
If you don't have a login, you can create one, which means when you sign in, you would um, fill out what we call an applicant profile. Um, and then once you filled out an app applicant profile, then you can start looking at the opportunities. I believe on the actual call, we do have a link um, where you can find more information on how to how to sign log in basically if this is your first time. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of once you're actually in the application, there's going to be, and correct me if I'm wrong, Sophie, I believe like three different uh, parts of the application materials that we're looking at. Um, perfect. Well, and for folks that uh, we don't have it usually listed here, but every for every opportunity, we always have a demographic survey. So you would fill that in. But then after that, you would address these three parts here. So there will be um, what we call a task for you to upload a bio or resume. Usually we ask for it to be in a PDF, no more than two pages. Um, and if you're applying as a team, uh, just submit one PDF or for a bio resume for each team member and not to, uh, not to um, uh, have more than two pages per team member. Um, again, there's, there's a panel reading these materials. We don't want them to be overloaded with too much reading material um, as there's gonna be already a lot of reading material. Um, there's a statement of interest. Uh, that would actually be in uh, a separate application, uh, which what was called a task in the system. So an application task that will include the statement of interest and the eight images of past work samples. And when you log into the application uh, task, the first page will be filling out just your contact info and then also filling out the statement of interest. Uh, and what we're starting to do now is offer folks the ability to do one of two ways in which they respond to that statement of interest. So if you wanted to do a written statement, it's up to 3000 characters. Uh, and I believe in the call, there are prompts that are asking you to respond to. So you can look at those questions and make sure you um, uh, have those questions inform the statement that you're giving. And then the second, uh, if you don't want to do a written statement, uh, some people find it just easier to, to do something that's more audio or video. We do have that as well. And you can upload that, no, making it no longer than two minutes. Um, and again, using that audio or video to respond to the prompts that have been asked uh, for in the statement of interest. Then once you fill out that part, you would actually go to the next page. And I know we had a question here from um, Genevieve, who was like, I don't see on the application where you might be able to upload your examples. It would be on that second page of that application task. And there, there's going to be a drop down menu or a question, I should say, that's going to ask you how many um, artwork examples would you like to submit? Then there's a drop down and you can choose however many you want, one to eight. And then once you select that number, that will, uh, it will pop up however many fields for artwork images that you've selected. Um, and so with that, you know, a lot of basic information about it, which is, you know, what's the title, how much did the piece costs, uh, what's the dimensions, what's the material, um, you would fill all that information out. And we really do encourage folks to fill out the conceptual information, um, especially if it's not something that's just very obvious, or if there's like a larger story connected to it, please make use of that conceptual information piece um, to give the panel more context of what they're viewing. Um, and there isn't actually a character limit on that. So feel free to like put as much as or as little information as you think would benefit um, the panel. And I really would encourage folks to also think about like, I know if there, I can see the names. I know there's, there's quite a few folks who have definitely applied to opportunities in the past. So I know folks know how to do this. But for those that are, this is your first time or that you're applying at this um, in a public art process, this the application is really your first time meeting meeting the panel. Um, so they're really like this is like that first impression, uh, and so wanting you to take that time and be thoughtful both in your responses and then what kind of images you think speak best about what you would be willing to do if you were selected, like would demonstrate your ability to accomplish. Um, should you be awarded the commission. So 
um yeah thank you sal yeah totally and just just to add to that another another tip i would just want to re reiterate is that the prompts that are given for the statement of interest have been developed by uh, the panel and the project team so it's very specific and they're not just as in they're not just arbitrary like they are specific and they're there for a reason and we want to know your responses to those things so try to speak to those things as best you can um, and the other thing to mention at this point is we have another call open at the moment for the Midland Library for an interior artwork um, for the gathering circle those um that project and this project are very similar in a lot of ways. And so when we were putting these uh, requests for qualifications together, we decided that there might be artists that would be interested in applying for both opportunities. And so in order to be generous to those folks and not ask people to submit two applications for very similar opportunities, what we did was we created the ability to apply for both. Um, through one application. So as part of your application process in the portal, you at the beginning will be asked if you are interested in applying for both or just one, and you can select and there's no pressure if you feel more called to one than the other, that's fine, just select one. Um, but if you would like to be considered for both, select both and then your one application will be be reviewed for both opportunities so it's totally up to you but we just wanted to give you that option um, if, if you wanted to be considered what I will say is it's unlikely that you will get both <laughs> um, if you are considered for both we can only pick you or select you for one project um, so there is that caveat but if you would like us to review your application for Midland and for Holgate for these two open calls right now, um, you can make that decision as part of your application and we will we will do that. Thanks Sophie for saying that. that's really helpful to know. And I, I also wanna just, I see a question here, mm -hmm. um, uh, which is Rudy, hey Rudy, yeah. um, are applicants only informed if they are in the running? No, you will receive communication from us regardless of the decision. Um, and I know that, that a lot of you are waiting to hear um, information about a call that went out earlier this um, this summer. Um, and that process has taken us a little bit longer than we expected, but we um, are planning to share uh, information with you in the next week or two. Um, so uh, we try to make sure that everybody gets information and then that, that you're not just left wondering. Um, but our panelists take their job very seriously. And so sometimes um, decisions can take longer and processes get pushed out further than we would like. So um, you will, you should receive communication from us regardless of the decision. Thanks, Sophie. Yeah. Okay, so the, one of the most important parts is that applications are due um, Thursday, November 3rd, which I can't believe I'm gonna say, but I think is next week, is that right? <laughs> yeah. when did that happen um so next thursday 5 p.m um as sal um uh, as sal mentioned you need to go to rack.org forward slash apply to get into the opportunity portal um some tips some extra tips um Please ask questions either now or you can email us and we are happy to answer questions um try not to i'm saying with a squinty face because i know that i do it too because i also apply for things myself um try not to wait till the last minute to apply um we can't always guarantee that we'll be available to answer questions at the last minute that's why we ask you to do that um if um using the opportunity portal presents a barrier for you in any way again let us know and we will try to help um help overcome that some um, important dates. So the application um, due date, which we just talked about next week, uh, the panel review and artist selection will go through November and December, like we talked about, and we hope to have an artist selected by December. Uh, we anticipate that community engagement um, and, and participatory design and the design phase would happen between January and June of next year, so 23. Um, there would be a design review probably in June before moving on to fabrication. Uh, June through February of 2024, um, with obviously installation ha happening towards the end of that, that time. Um, and then artwork complete and installed by March of 24. And with that, I think 
we're finished. And you all have been asking questions along the way, which I love. I love that kind of participatory engagement. But if you have anything else that you want to talk about now, we're here. And I know we're kind of at time, but we maybe can hang on for another couple of minutes um, while we have, especially while we have Jeannie, because you, you have access to Salvador and me all the time, but you don't always have access to Jeannie. So um, I'm going to stop sharing my screen. Um, Sophie, I wonder, because I know you said that uh, yes, Karen's I've question earlier. Yeah, thank you. But if you want, I also, Karen, do you mind um, actually putting your email in the chat? And if we, if Sophie's not able to find the information, she can email you directly a response to your question. I think that would be helpful. But if there are any additional, oh, we've got some other questions. Okay, so um, do you mind managing that while I just try and find the answer to Karen's question? No problem. Uh, so if we have applied for the Midland Library External Artwork RFQ already, are we still encouraged to apply to this opportunity and the Midland Library Interior Artwork opportunity? I would apply for all the opportunities. Okay, so please apply uh, for this one. Uh, Who, who's asking that question? Anonymous attendee. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, I yes, would, anonymous attendee. I would just say apply for all of them. You know, there's no harm in applying. Okay. And then anonymous attendee also asked, um, are you looking for artists who have prior mural experience? Or is it okay if somebody has experience with large scale work, but not murals? Ooh, can you say it one more time for me? Yeah. Are you looking for artists who have prior mural experience or is it okay if somebody has experience with large scale work, but not murals? Yeah, I think that's fine because it's not necessarily going to be a mural, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Okay, so the answer yes. to Karen's question is that the additional budget for materials, fabrication, and installation is about $100,000. So pretty generous budget. Thanks, Sophie. Yeah. Are Do you there... have anything you want to add that I may yeah. have missed? Uh, on the budget? No, just on anything. Oh, oh just on anything. Um, I think... Um, Or anything you want people to know about? Yeah, I'm trying to think what we didn't cover. Um, I think uh, I think the um, calming theme is is something to really reflect it back from the voting that the colors and the um, things that people chose really reflect that. So I want to point that out. I think um, you know nature themed. Uh, uh, I don't think, you know, if you walked into the building that we've designed, no one would know that butterfly is, you know, was a symbol or that the design team talked about it. So it is not, um, you know, a requirement or, or you do not have to respond to either nature or butterfly in any literal way. Right. Uh, just wanted to make sure that's clear. I think there's open to, to what that is, but yeah. um, I want to make sure that people didn't feel like they, they were uh, needing to respond to that directly. Yeah, yeah, I think it's more um, that we're looking for an artwork that complements those those design design decisions so far and those concepts, right? Yep. Yeah. All right. You're welcome, Emmerich. Thank you for being here with us this evening. Um, so unless anybody has any other questions, I think we're gonna wrap up for tonight. Um, like I said, please feel free to contact us if, if anything does come up between now and next week. Um, otherwise we look forward to receiving your applications. That's one of the, the best parts is reading all of your work, reading about all of your work. And Sophie, are you doing another info session this week? Oh, yes. So thanks, Sal. We're doing another info session on Wednesday, the 26th. That one is from the Midland Library opportunity for the Gathering Circle. So if you all are interested in applying for that one too, come see us on Wednesday. Um, we'll be back in the Zoom space um, for that. Thank Wonderful. you, Lisa. All right, thank you everybody. Have a great evening. Good night all.